Okay, thank you for the introduction. Okay, so yeah, this is a presentation for a sampling paper I co-wrote with uh, Anis, who's also here at the, at the conference. It's actually the shortest paper I've ever written for a full-track paper. The whole content of the paper is on, the f on this slide. Uh, it's only six uh, pages long. Uh, so the reason why it's so short is because the contribution is very specialized um, uh, for, for pass tracing. So speaking of which, if you have a pass tracer, you have your rays that you use to intersect uh, surfaces, most probably triangles, and then you have materials that will give the appearance of uh, the surface. And the way this works is uh, that whenever your ray hits the surface, it will deviate in a certain direction that is predicted uh, by the material. And so if you're interested in uh, having a state-of-the-art material model, you probably have uh, support for GGX BRDFs. And if you do, then you probably have somewhere in your code base this little snippet that is due to uh, Eric Heights. And our contribution is to actually propose a different implementation that is both uh, simpler, so I guess you can already see it's shorter, and also faster. Uh, so at this point, I want to emphasize that this is not the result of uh, optimization over the original code, but it's rather due to a novel insight that leads to a completely different uh, implementation. And this insight is related to linking the GGX VNDF, which is the, uh, the code that is due to Eric, with uh, spherical caps. And so this is what I want to focus uh, on in the remainder of this uh, presentation. So I'm going to start by talking about the GGX uh, VNDF, two acronyms. So if you're not familiar with this, it can be a bit uh, scary. So GGX first, so that's uh, a distribution that's involved in microfacet theory. So microfacet theory was introduced by uh, Bruce Walton and colleagues in uh, 2007. So uh, microfacet theory is uh, a physical framework to explain the appearance of surfaces by basically um, explaining that the appearance is the result of interactions between a microsurface and your incident rays. And GGX is a distribution to describe the distribution of orientations of the facets that compose the surface. And another way to see it is that this distribution encodes the, di uh, the distribution of, of normals that lie at the surface of an ellipsoid. And th there are some very nice insights you can get from this theory. Like, for instance, if you stretch the surface, you'll get a rougher appearance. And conversely, if you flatten it, you'll get a shinier uh, appearance. What you can also do is stretch it anisotropically to create some uh, brushed metal effects, such as this and this. So in the original paper, uh, Bruce Walter introduced an important sampling mechanism as well, uh, which consists of uh, sampling a random normal, so a, a green uh, vector here, uh, at the surface of the ellipsoid. And the problem is uh, this important sampling mechanism introduces some artifacts, such as fireflies, that you can see here, hopefully. Uh, and this was fixed by uh, the paper of Eric that I talked about in the introduction uh, by introducing this VNGF sampler. And basically the idea is, rather than randomly picking a, a green vector at the surface of the ellipsoid, you're going to pick a green vector that lies at the intersection of uh, the projection of the ellipsoid in your incident direction and uh, the ellipsoid. So that, that would be the green area. And what you have to do basically is to uniformly sample this projected area. Um, and the way he does so is by uh, in three steps. So first, you have the ellipsoid. He uses an invariant to re-express the problem into that of sampling a hemisphere. So you basically recompress the ellipsoid to, to an hemisphere. This also warps the incident direction. I hope you can see uh, uh, that the red line isn't quite the same. And then he has an algorithm to sample solely the, the hemisphere, which has less degrees of freedom. And then he applies the inverse transformation to warp back to uh, the ellipsoid. So basically, in terms of code, it's, very, it's essentially three lines. So first, <coughs> you warp the incident direction to re-express the problem into that of sampling a hemisphere, sample the hemisphere, and then warp back to the ellipsoid. Um, and so what we contribute to in this work is to re uh, the replacement of this specific routine, sampling the hemisphere. So this is the original code of Eric. Uh, here's a quick animation to show how it works. Left click. OK. So here, <coughs> I'm using an autographic projection and looking at the, uh, at the hemisphere. Here, I'm going to freeze the viewpoint so you can see the, the projected area. Um, and then the code uh, allows you to uh, map two random numbers into this uh, green area, sample it, and then uh, re-express it back to the, uh, at the surface of the hemisphere. And this works for arbitrary incident directions. So here, I'm, I'm changing the incident direction. Uh, yeah, and that's it. OK, so that's for the GGX VNDF. So now on to the insights and the relation to spherical caps. I'm going to explain what spherical caps are uh, in just a minute. So what we did was to consider the uh, original sampling scheme of Eric. And we considered, uh, we looked at uh, uh, just one sample. 
and assume that the hemisphere would act as a perfect mirror. So this means that we can compute from uh, the surface normal in green and the red direction, an orange direction, which corresponds to the mirror reflection uh, of the incident direction. And we plot this uh, direction as a point at the surface of the sphere. So if you do this for various samples, you get more and more points. So I'm, I'm doing it more and more. And what you can notice is that as we add in more samples, it seems that the samples are starting to cover the entire sphere. Almost, actually. Uh, there's an area here under this particular plain, uh, plane in gray that isn't covered. It doesn't have any samples. And this particular orange geometry here, is, it's called a spherical cap. So it's just a sphere that is restricted to uh, by a plane, and you're only looking at uh, the area that's above this plane. And so it turns out that in the paper, we show uh, two things. So a hemispherical mirror reflects uh, parallel rays uniformly and within a spherical cap. So uh, I have uh, uh, an entire proof in the paper by using uh, Jacobians. But so intuitively, for, for the uniform part, uh, it's known that if you look into a spherical mirror, you know that the incident rays will be reflected uniformly. And since a hemisphere is a restriction of the sphere, then it's obviously uniform too. And for the spherical cap uh, section, I can show you a few examples. So what we show is that the, the plane of uh, that uh, cuts off the, the sphere is completely determined by the elevation of the incident direction. So if we change the incident direction, the plane, if we go downwards, the plane is going to go up, up to this limit case where you're looking at the hemisphere above and you only have some directions that go straight up. So that's a, a Dirac distribution here. And conversely, if you go upwards, up to the uh, upward direction, you cover the entire sphere and here you're uh, sampling the sphere uniformly. So <coughs> in just a bit of intuitions because I know this is can be counterintuitive. There's uh, an IKEA shop uh, next to the university, and they sell this, this lamp. And so if you look at this lamp uh, from uh, a particular direction, so here I'm looking from above, so you're going to see all the direction above it. So if you have this environment here around you, this is what you're going to see in the lamp. And if I move around the lamp, so if I look uh, horizontally, you'll get this restriction. And this is what's going to happen is you're going to see half of the uh, environment. And uh, again, if you go downwards, you're going to restrict it a bit more. So here's a, an animation to show everything for various uh, um, observation conditions. So here I'm going upwards. I'm just showing the projected area again, sampling it. Uh, so here in orange, you have the uh, reflected directions that cover that sample the entire sphere. And this is why <coughs> when I go back here, you see the entire environment. So you have the ceiling at the center, the doors in the middle, and at the boundaries, you have the floor. So now I'm going uh, rotating around the, the hemisphere. So here we can see half of it. And then going downwards again, you get a uh, restriction that gets more and more important. OK. So uh, what do we do with this? Um, well. Uh, we build our sampling uh, algorithm based on this particular insight. So the idea is, since you have these red directions and these green directions, from these two quantities, you can infer the orange directions on the, on the, uh, on the spherical cap. What you can also do is, if you have the orange directions and the red ones, you can compute the green directions, which are the normals that we want to sample. And the way this works is as follows. So you start by sampling, uh, randomly sampling the, the spherical cap. And then, so I'm plotting it here on the hemisphere, so you get uh, a random direction here. You add, and then you compute the half vector. So you just add the incident direction, and then the sum of the, the two directions is directly proportional to the normal. And so if you normal, normalize this direction, you get a normal at the surface of the hemisphere that is directly sampling the GGX VNDF. So that's it. You just have to return this half vector. And so if you look at our code, this is exactly what we do. So we sample a spherical cap. These lines of code just place a, uh, an orange sample at the surface of the cap. And then we just add the two directions without normalizing it. I just discuss it's a quick optimization that I discussed in the paper. And that's all we have to do. And so it's simpler than the method of Eric, because Eric has three uh, steps. So first, he needs to build an orthonormal basis around this green area, which has a singularity if you're looking uh, above, uh, above the hemisphere. Then you have to sample this area that has well, at least a more complicated shape than that of a spherical cap. So there's more arithmetic involved in there. And then you have to reproject at the surface of the hemisphere. So there's three steps uh, compared to us, which is only two.
And so in terms of speed, so we benched our uh, code. So first in a standalone fashion where we ran um, both codes 100 times and we took the median time on both uh, a CPU and then there we measured the uh, 36% uh, uh, improvement, and also on the GPU, uh, an Intel Arc, I I and that resulted in a 40% faster. If you were to use another GPU, uh, you would also observe uh, similar speedups. Um, okay, and then we did some renderings in the PBRT4. Um, so we have the same variance reduction, so no additional noise compared to the original method. And then we also did some uh, benchmarks, performance benchmarks, and here we observed some much less important speedups. And the reason was that uh, basically when you're doing uh, path tracing with global illumination, the bottleneck isn't the uh, material sampler, it's the int ray triangle intersection. So, uh, I mean, the takeaway is that Best case scenario, you'll get a 40% improvement if you're bottlenecked by your material sampler, and if not, you'll get uh, a, v a much less significant improvement, but it will be systematic. So there's no really no good reason not to use it, I would say, subjectively. <laughs> okay, that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you for the great talk as well. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, you get the cube of destiny. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. I'm wondering if you even need to compute the half vector in the end, because oftentimes when you do this VNDF sampling right after that, you compute the reflection vector again, because that's where you will trace your ray. Yeah, so that's a, a good question. So there's a bit of a subtlety, and I had this question before. So when you're sampling the hemisphere, you're basically sampling the VNDF of a GGX with wa roughness 1. Okay? And for other configurations, you need to stretch the ellipsoid. And so this stretching operation composed with the specular reflection is not equivalent to stretching the outgoing directions directly from the hemisphere. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Are there any more questions? Just <coughs> <for> you? <coughs> Sorry. So on that point, because I had the question about how you handle different roughnesses, is there also a step afterwards to then warp it to an ellipsoid? Uh, yeah, um, so okay. actually, uh, yeah, maybe that wasn't super clear. Uh, let's go back to the general algorithm. Okay, so that's basically, that's your sampler. Yes. That's the sampler you're going to call. And in this sampler, there's the hemisphere sampling routine. So you're not supposed to call this uh, code directly. You're supposed to call this one. And actually, the reason why, well, since you asked, the reason why I'm not normalizing the half vector is because there's a normalize right here at line 8. So you don't need to do it twice. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Thank you so much. Are there any more questions? doesn't seem so. So uh, I have one more question. Uh, yep. Do you think you can extend the same idea to transmission? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So y it's completely transparent. So what what you do is here you sample a normal and you can use this normal to either reflect, refract, or you can other also use some other fancier BRDFs to control the um, the final uh, bounce. So it's yeah, you can you can use it in conductors and actually uh, at the end I have um, so I have uh, sorry, I went too far. Here. So here you have uh, yeah. some conductors and here's some dielectrics. Cool. So it's completely cool. transparent. Thanks. So let's thank the speaker again for the great talk.